Hi, my name is Gar Lawrence and thanks for tuning into my podcast today. If you're enjoying these conversations and you want to check out more of this transformational work, be sure to come back to guylawrence.com.au and join me as we go further down the rabbit hole. Enjoy the show. Patrick, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Guy. Good to be here. I, I must admit, I've been submersed in your work uh, especially over the last couple of weeks, knowing you were coming on the show. And for the, the depth and knowledge of this topic just even blew my mind. Like I knew the breath was, was a pretty, um, pretty important aspect of, of health, but it's just incredible. It's a rabbit hole, mate. And I'm, I'm not sure if I can find the bottom of it yet. <laughs> but hopefully we'll see how we do today. Well, it's like this guy. It's, it's kind of strange because the more I'm in the field and the more I work in it, um, the more I realize what I don't know. And it's changing. It's entirely changing. It's okay. Like since 2002, we've been involved with breathing full time. And there's more applications. And I think the science is starting to catch up now. So I think it's, it's hot. The topic is hot. And, you know, for, for good reasons. Yeah, totally. Well, I'm, I'm always intrigued and I ask everyone at the start of the show this, and, and you just showed me your diary off there and you travel a hell of a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So if you sat next to a stranger on an airplane and they asked you what you did for a living, what, how, how would you answer that these days? I just tell them I write a book. I write books. Um, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> because if I speak to somebody about breathing who's not really interested in it, their eyes just glass over and they're not too bothered. It's not like talking to somebody and having, having a conversation about a game of football or something. Now, if on the other hand, I connect with somebody who is knowing about meditation, the breath, focus, concentration, then we could have a good story. And it's one of those things. It's a little bit about med like meditation. You could sit down on a plane beside somebody and start talking to somebody about meditation. Well, if they haven't already done it, and if they don't feel a willingness towards it, they probably won't be interested. So maybe it was because when I was introducing this work 20 years ago, that I was met with in some quarters with skepticism, and especially in medical circles, even though it was based on normal medical physiology. Like I wasn't, you know, it was, I was drawing information basically from what was available. And yet I often wondered why doctors weren't encouraging patients to breathe through their nose, why asthma societies weren't encouraging people with asthma, children with asthma, why the dental profession weren't encouraging children to breathe through the nose, and um, why sleep medicine isn't encouraging functional breathing. And because we've seen the results and the results are there, but the results are often buried in the literature. So it's to make a long story short, I never kind of want to waste my energy yeah. talking to people who are not interested. And if there's loads of people who are interested and that's where we have a great conversation and that's why I'm here. Yeah, beautiful. And what led you to look at the breath in the first place, especially 20 years ago, if it wasn't even spoken about much back then? I think, well, I know it was because of my own health issues. Okay. I was a kid growing up as a chronic mouth breather. And when I go to my mother's house and she starts pulling out photos, she's in her 80s now, and she'll pull out photos. And every single photograph of me as a child, my mouth was wide open. And, you know, you cannot reach your full potential if you have your mouth open. People with nasal obstruction, if they have a stuffy nose, which is causing mouth breathing, they are twice as likely to have sleep problems. Now, I can give you more statistics on this with regards to children who are mouth breathing. If they are mouth breathing, which is causing even just snoring, they have 40% increased risk of special education needs by age five. There's loads of studies on this. There's oh, one yeah. study involving 11,000 children in Stratford-upon-Avon, and there was a 40% risk of special education needs due to sleep disorder breathing, and one of the contributory factors there is mouth breathing. That's incredible. So I came across it by accident. I did a master's degree in economics, um, but my health was deteriorating. And I always knew, it, like in university, I wasn't... 
I was one of those guys to get grades. I really, really had to put in the hours. And I did. I put in hours. Like, I worked from 9 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night. And my peers didn't have to do that. And I didn't get top grades with that. I got average grades. Because the issue is, if your breathing is off, like, there's a huge interconnectivity between three pillars in health. And I'm only looking at three. I'm not talking about nutrition because I know nothing about it. But say, for instance, the breath, sleep, and the emotions. Mm. If your mind is active and if you're stressed, it impacts your breathing. But if your breathing is fast and shallow, it agitates the mind. And if your breathing is fast and shallow, it affects you. And if your sleep is affected, your emotions are affected. And if your emotions are affected, you can't sleep properly. So here is one triangle with each factor interplaying into each other. And I think it's amazing because, you know, I remember giving a talk to psychotherapists in Ireland and we had 40 psychotherapists in the room. And I told him, I said, listen, cognitive behavioral therapy is excellent because I've heard great stuff about it. But I said, it's not changing breathing physiology. And what I'm here today is just to show you the connection, or at least to draw it out, the connection between breathing physiology and anxiety of the mind. Because if you do CBT with a client, but if that client continues fast, shallow mm-hmm. breathing, irregular breathing with disrupted sleep, they're not going to get the calmness of the mind that they really deserve. And the other thing is, if the mind is agitated, how can you meditate? So I like to give, like I often say to people that meditation is wonderful. It truly is. But when I'm working with people who come in with anxiety, many of them have tried meditation, but they just don't stick it. And they don't stick it because they probably feel they're getting nowhere in -hmm. terms of their mind is so active. So we give them small little breath hold exercises. I think it's very important with the breath to realize that it's not just about taking a deep breath. It's not just about taking a big breath. Like all too often we hear is, oh, you're stressed, take a deep breath. And, you know, the more air you breathe, the less oxygen gets delivered to the brain. So big breathing is going to agitate the mind. So we need to give a series of breathing exercises, depending on the person coming into us. And looking at breathing from three different dimensions. One is the biochemistry of the breath, because you can literally improve blood flow and oxygen delivery from the blood to the cells, but just by changing the the chemistry of the breath, sorry, just by changing the the volume of breathing to change the biochemistry of the blood. The second aspect is looking at the biomechanics of breathing. This is getting diaphragmatic breathing. And of course the diaphragm is connected with the emotions, but your diaphragm is also connected with the upper airway the later muscles. And these muscles play a very important role in sleep and keeping the airway open. So if you have an individual who is mouth breathing during sleep, they're more likely, well, of course, mouth snoring, but also because they're mouth breathing, they're breathing using their upper chest and their airway is more liable to collapse. So the other aspect then is looking at cadence breathing. When you slow down the breathing rate to six breaths per minute in terms of stimulating the vagus nerve, increasing heart rate variability, Hmm. improving respiratory sinus arrhythmia, and getting a balance between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And that's just looking at functional breathing. That's not even looking at breath holding when you're dropping blood oxygen saturation to reduce lactic acid and fatigue. You know, so, you know, I think it's tremendous. But I think what what people have realized that, you know, how many times have we heard one instructor will focus on the biomechanics of breathing but they completely sacrifice the biochemistry in, the first, in, the, in that instance. You know, they'll focus so much on breathing using the diaphragm, lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs, but in the process taking big breaths. And in that process, they get rid of too much carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is seen to be waste gas. But we have to bear in mind since 1904 that the release of oxygen from the red blood cells to the cells is dependent on the presence of carbon dioxide. And it's called the Bohr effect. Yeah, the, the, there are so many things you've just triggered in me already. Uh, and w- one thing that was, when you, you spoke about, you know, because um, it feels like the spiral and effect that everything leads into each other. Yes. 
And yep. we, we forget about, um, I always used to think about incidental fitness, but we, we, we're guilty of this in many aspects because we used to get people coming in and they would exercise and train hard for an hour and then they would go and sit down for the rest of the day and, and live this sedentary life. And then it was just hoping to compensate for everything else. And it reminds me of the same with the yes. breasts where we breathe in 24 hours a day, you know, there, yes. And we, we yeah. yeah. And even yeah. with meditation, I would say meditation is what you do with your eyes open during the day. Absolutely. You know, it's like this Absolutely. constant, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I have to totally agree with you. Mm. Absolutely. And um, because you know it yourself, people are going to yoga studios. They're doing breathing exercise in the yoga studio. How are they breathing outside of it? And really that's what I, I want to you know. I'm, how is the person breathing when they go for a walk? How are they breathing when they get stressed? How can you handle stress through the breath? How do you breathe during sleep? Like, for example, we tape the mouths at night. And I know that can sound very bizarre. And we've been doing it for 20 years. And oh, wow. even with children, we have a tape coming out, myo tape. But it's designed just to go around the lips, just to bring the lips together. Because if you have your mouth open at night, you're not getting a deep night's sleep. And if you don't get deep sleep, you don't get rest and recovery because the process of restorative sleep is for the brain to clean itself. And uh, if, if sleep is shallow, that's when we really, really get health problems if people have light sleep. Yeah. Would that be a great place to start? Taping the mouth up when yes. we go to bed at night? I, I... Yeah, of course. Like I'll give you my example with this. I was waking hmm. up feeling fatigued every morning as a kid going into school then onto university i was shattered but you kind of learn to live with it because if that's all you know that's all you know hmm. but i remember when i was in university i was doing erasmus in sweden and uh, i was in the dorms with with other students and one of them told me the next morning he says jesus he says we thought you were going to die last night and of course like i didn't think that. he says you were breathing but then you were stopping breathing and of course, I had a clue what that was. But then I find out later, about 15 years later, 20 years later, it's, it's undiagnosed, undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea, which is really common with people with asthma. Um, and as asthma severity increases, so does sleep apnea. And by the way, Australia has one of the highest incidences of asthma in the world. It's either one or two. And the UK, I think, is number three. And Ireland is number four. So you will have a, a certain amount of the population, those who are experiencing either hay fever, childhood asthma, which they've grown out mm -hmm. of, asthma, exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, breathing problems. But in any event, my reason for waking up exhausted was I have very poor craniofacial development because of mouth breathing during childhood. My tongue isn't in the roof of the mouth. I don't have the development of my lower jaws. And as a result, my jaws are set back in the airway my airway is compromised. And when your airway is compromised, um, you're more likely to have collapse of the airway during sleep, so you stop breathing. So first and foremost, the real time to get nasal breathing is during childhood, during the development of the face. Now, I then, in 2000, no, it was in 1998, I read a newspaper article, and the article spoke about this Russian doctor. And this Russian doctor worked with cosmonauts during the Soviet space race. And his kind of work was to find out what's the, the optimal concentration of oxygen um, going up into, into space in, in terms of capsule. And he was working with breathing. And then he noticed that people who were, who were getting sick when he was back in a hospital, people who were getting sick were breathing hard. Now, he asked the question, was it their sickness which caused their breathing to be excessive, that they were running out of air? that they were panting, that they were gasping. Mm. Or he said, was it their hard breathing which was contributing to the symptoms? So he started asking, well, what happens when you breathe hard? And the available research back then, even back in the 1950s, was if you breathe hard, you get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs, and the loss of carbon dioxide from the blood causes blood vessels to constrict, and also, in technical terms, causes a left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. But in very simple terms, if you breathe hard, you get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood and oxygen isn't released as readily to the tissues. So it's ironic that the harder we breathe, 
the less air gets delivered. So people who are unfit, at the very least, or people who are not well, they tend to breathe hard. And, you know, he wasn't alone because even more recently, there's an Italian cardiologist called, and I'll come back to my story in a while, Luciano Bernardi. And Luciano Bernardi is, is a cardiologist with a huge interest in yoga. And he wrote a paper back in 2001, I think it was, and he looked at people with chronic heart failure. And, you know, a patient with chronic heart failure, it's normal that they will experience excessive breathlessness during physical exercise. They go for a walk and they breathe. They, they, get, they run out of air, you know. They don't have mm -hmm. exercise tolerance. Well, most doctors will probably say, well, that patient has excessive breathlessness because of their chronic heart failure. But Bernardi asked a question. He asked, could the excessive breathlessness be due to an increased chemosensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide? In other words, has the body become too sensitive to the increased CO2 coming from the cells into the blood because it's carbon dioxide that stimulates your breathing? So you can imagine as part of metabolism, carbon dioxide is coming from the cells into the blood and that then in turn is changing into carbonic, forming carbonic acid, which in turn is dissociating into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. But as carbon dioxide increases, so does hydrogen ion. And as hydrogen ion increases, blood pH drops. And the respiratory center in the brain reacts to the change in blood pH. So if you have an individual with a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, they will breathe hard during physical exercise. So he said, let's get these people to slow down their breathing, to reduce the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. And when he did so, their breathlessness reduced during physical exercise. And it's, you know, so this stuff is all out there, but it's buried in the literature. And there's another thing. Um, if you even just change the cadence of the breath, and say if you were breathing 12 breaths, 12 breaths per minute, say, mm -hmm. and if you reduce it to six, and if you kept the volume the same per minute, you will increase your breathing efficiency by 20%. You'll have 20% more oxygen coming into the lungs. So there's so much here that we can play with, but... Back to my story, taping of the mouth. I read the newspaper article. I did an exercise to open up my nose. My nose was stuffy for 20 years, constantly. I had an operation on my nose in 1994. The surgeon never told me to breathe through it. And from 1994 to 1998, I kept on breathing through my mouth. Now, you could say that's daft, but it's not. Because if you fix the nose, you have to fix the behavior. My nose was fixed, but the behavior wasn't fixed, and I kept on mouth breathing. So in any event, 1998, decongested my nose, went to sleep that night, I used Breathe Bright strips over my nose to open up my nose, just in case it collapsed during sleep, and I wore paper tape across my lips. And yeah, the first night was kind of getting used to it, and the second night went to sleep with it again. The second morning I woke up, and I swore to God, it was the best night's sleep that I'd ever had in my life. I'd never realized what was it like to wake up feeling absolute alertness wow. and concentration. And I've taped, this is no exaggeration, I have taped my mouth every night pretty much since. Maybe a couple of exceptions here and there. Um, but other than that, yeah. So it's huge. And I'm not saying for people to tape up their mouth every night. But what I am saying is, if your mouth is open during your sleep, you're not likely to wake up feeling refreshed. You're likely to have more shallow and light sleep. You're more likely to go to the bathroom. And here it comes back to the mind. We have patients coming in, our clients coming in with depression, with high anxiety, with high stress, with panic disorder. And I often ask them, I said, listen, but I ask everybody, I said, how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? And they generally will tell me, they wake up feeling exhausted. And I say, well, has your doctor, has your healthcare professional ever asked you to do a sleep study? Have they ever investigated your sleep? They said, no. And the reason being is because I think the healthcare professional is assuming that it's the depression which is causing the exhaustion. But maybe we should be asking, is it the exhaustion? which in turn is reducing productivity, which in turn is reducing quality of life, which in turn is reducing our ability to cope with everyday life's demands. 
And if you have anxiety over a period of time, could that be leading to depression? So what's the chicken and the egg here? We have to look at sleep. And I was in the corporate world, highly stressed, hated my job, absolutely hated it. And uh, I felt that we were totally controlled by information technology. There was pressure put on me. I was in middle management. I was only in my early 20s. And I was putting pressure then on the staff. It's a crazy situation. And now I'm starting to look at the connection between burnout. And I'm 46 years of age now. I would be thrown out onto the trash heap now of any multinational company because why would they have an old boy like me? Because I'd be considered you know, an older guy. Why would they bother with an employee like me, which would require too much wages? Instead, they just get rid of me and they put in a 20 year old in, in, their, in my place. Mm -hmm. So we really have to wonder what's going on there. And this is why I think the ability to be able to handle stress, because we as human beings, Guy, we're not able, we're not able to cope with long-term stress, never throughout our evolution. Where were we confronted with long-term stress? It was always short-term, but through the breath, we can influence those functions that are outside of our control, our normal control. Yeah, totally. With, just regarding yourself on, on that, um, because you, you're someone that travels, like I said, a lot, and you would yes. have to manage stress. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, with yourself being such a conscious person and a conscious breather with this work, naturally, they're going to come hand in hand. How much do you think that's affected your life in terms of being able to, I guess, even let go and let go of the things that are probably yes. really don't have that much meaning, but we put so much emphasis on it, especially when we're coming from a stress state. And it's been huge. Yeah. Um, I don't know how people can, can cope, to be honest with you, unless they have something like the breath to be able to reduce agitation of the mind. You know, I was a very active thinker. Um, I give you a story. I wrote about it in a book called Anxiety Free. This was even before I just, well, about the same time, I kind of came across mindfulness and spirituality and I came across breathing together and they do go pretty much hand in hand. I went to, to a seminar in Dublin and I went in with a very agitated mind. There was never gaps between thoughts. I was constantly stuck in my head. So I'd walk down a street, I wouldn't even see the street because I wasn't living with any connectivity with anything around me. Always my attention was on my head, regurgitating, you know, um, thought after thought. So I went to this seminar and the seminar, the, the instructors, there were two instructors there. They must have been in presence because I don't know what happened in that seminar, but I came out of that seminar and I walked down Grafton Street in Dublin and it was the first time that I actually seen the street. It was almost as if just a pair of blinkers was taken off me, that all of those levels of conditioning had reduced. And I just remember feeling such an innate calmness going down the street. Now, I woke up the next morning, my head was just in as bad a state as it was before that, but I was after getting a taste of something. And I was intrigued, I have to say, I was absolutely intrigued. So I started then focusing on the breath more, and I can really understand why people get frustrated with it. Because when you start focusing on the breath at first, you start to realize, all the nonsense that goes through the human mind. Mm. And we never seem to think that everybody is in the same boat. So you're bringing to it, you're, to, you're bringing really to the surface all those incessant and repetitive and often very negative thoughts and fruitless thinking, useless thinking, thinking that completely drains us of energy. And I think society is really good at keeping this thinking in place because I think it kind of subdues the population to some degree and fill them up with news, which by the way, I stopped reading the news 20 years ago as well. No newspapers, um, don't ever purposely listen to the news. I might catch it by accident here and there. So it can kind of sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll catch it and be very careful what we let, in, let into our heads. But what I'm going to say is, yeah, at first you're, you're, you know, you're focusing on the breath and the mind is wandering and you're focusing on the breath and the mind is wandering. And 
over time, and I don't know how long does it take, but gaps start appearing between thinking. And it's almost that you're developing a muscle in the brain that you can then tap into that at will. And that's why if coaches ask me, can you recreate the flow? Well, I can, well, at least I feel I can. I can recreate the flow and I can do it because when I'm giving presentations, I'll go out to a room of maybe 500 people, no PowerPoints now, I don't use them. And mm. I'll talk off the cuff for one to two hours, just, you know, but to get into that state, I want a state of absolute focus and concentration because what is concentration? But our ability to place 100% of our attention on what we are doing without distraction of the mind. Now you think of the individual with an agitated mind. How can you concentrate? How can you focus? And if we look at the work, the quality of work of people with excellent concentration, and some people have this naturally. I often use the story of a guy when I was in university. I studied three months for an exam. And he wasn't studying because he was setting up a business at the time. We were only in our early 20s, maybe 21 years of age. And he said, Paddy, he says, do you have your notes there? And I said, I have. And this was 20 minutes before the exam. He hadn't opened the book. So I handed him my notes. And I remember him just looking at the notes. And I remember thinking at the time, I'd be staring at the notes, but no, none of the information was coming in. And as soon as I'd get to the bottom of the page, I'd have to go through it again. And that's how I kept on, you know, trying to force that information in. But I knew it was different with him. He was looking at the notes, but he had his full concentration on the notes. The two of us went off, we did our exam, and he got the same grade as I got. It took him 20 minutes and it took th me three months. Now I'll just go a little bit further with this guy because now with the hindsight of 20 years later, his name is Terry Clune. C-L-U-N-E is his surname. He's about 47 years of age. He set up at, at that time, when we were in university, he set up a business called taxback.com. And he's worth about 600 million euro, which is about a, a billion US or a billion Australian dollars. You, do, you don't, and by the way, this isn't about the finances, hmm. but this is about the quality of the individual to reach their full potential when they have the capacity to control the mind. Are we in control of the mind or is the mind in control of us? And if we are in control of the mind, can we stop thinking? Can we just put those thoughts aside to allow our full attention on whatever we want to focus upon? And what's more, totally. my attention, I developed it and it was pretty poor. But what about the youngsters who are coming in these kids who have grown up with social media, with internet technology, with mobile phones, and just look at the increase of anxiety. And by the way, you know, these kids, and I see my own child, of course they're watching YouTubers and they're watching these, and especially girls we have to be more concerned with because they're watching, if I, if I go into Instagram and we post on Instagram, all I see, the only people that I see posting their bodies are total posers, okay? Because you're not going to, if you've got a big belly on you, you're not going to exactly go there and start posting it on Instagram. So what are we seeing on Instagram then? We're seeing a very skewed portrayal of real life because everybody that we see on Instagram, they're beautiful looking, they're in great shape, and they've got great bodies. So then if you have a normal Joe Soap like me that comes on and you're looking at Instagram, you're saying, Jesus Christ, like, look at these. They are, they are perfect. And then you start saying, well, I am not perfect. And you're putting a lot of psychological pressure on yourself. That's Instagram, Facebook, and all of social media because it's not reflective of real life. And I think for girls, where image consciousness and that social pressure, we really have to watch that space. So I'm gonna to come to full circle here. This is where the breath comes in because I think there's three ways, and there, you know, there could be more, but in my, in my kind of own head, there's three ways that I would use to quieten the mind. One is I focus on, the, on my breathing. I bring my attention inwards, I slow down the breath, but I slow down the breath to create air hunger 
because if you slow down your breathing and breathe in really slow and you have a really relaxed slow breath out and if you consciously breathe less air than what you're used to carbon dioxide increases in the blood you know that carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood when you feel air hunger but as carbon dioxide increases your blood vessels open up and your hemoglobin releases releases oxygen more readily so if i'm doing a meditation I will incorporate it with functional breathing from a biochemical point of view because I can increase blood flow to the brain. And also, if you focus on the breath with the intention of deliberately slowing down the breath to create air hunger, the mind is more anchored on the breath. Mm -hmm. If we just say, if we do Vipassana or Anapanasati, and you focus on the breath, the mind wanders, you focus on the breath, the mind wanders. But if you have the focus, of deliberately slowing it down and you're feeling that air hunger and also physiologically if you increase oxygen delivery to the brain it has a calming effect on the central nervous system because hyperventilation or over breathing fast shallow breathing it's excitation for the mind so we need to look at the physiology of breathing as well as the psychological aspect of harnessing harnessing our attention on the breath now some of this has only been discovered recently. In March of 2017, Stanford Medical School, they identified a new structure in the brain, first in mice and then in humans. And they said this structure, which is, it's in the locus corollis, but this structure is spying on your breathing. And if you breathe fast, this structure in the brain is relaying signals of agitation to the rest of the brain. But if you really slow down your breath, this structure is relaying signals of calm to the rest of the brain. And what's more, if you breathe fast, you're more likely to be aroused from sleep. So your sleep quality isn't as good. And if your sleep quality isn't as good, then the mind is going to be more anxious the next day. It's all interlinked. And we often think about the diaphragm. People thinking about, you know, the diaphragm breathing muscle. Absolutely, breathe deep but don't breathe big. And the diaphragm, it is true, is connected with the emotions. Because when people get COPD and asthma, and when their breathing becomes more in the upper chest, there's a direct correlation with the increase in psychiatric symptoms. Not because of the feeling of suffocation, even though it could, could be a contributory factor. But when breathing is trained to slow down the breath using the diaphragm, psychiatric symptoms diminish. You know, incredible, and we 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 perceive we we see we don't see the world how it is. We dis, we see the world how yes. we are. Totally right, and and yeah. and that's driven from how we feel and how we think, and then we don't see the truth of it, but we see our perceived truth of it. Yes, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to dissolve those layers of conditioning which have huge. been added over time, and you know, if we, if we don't reinforce those pattern, those talk patterns with excessive thinking, I think they dissolve, that space dissolves. And then we are looking not through the filter of all that conditioning. Correct. Layers yeah. of conditioning. We really need to get the conditioning aside so that the true person can come out through. A young child has it. And you know, the, the essence of spirituality be innocent like a young kid. Mm. It's because the young child hasn't developed the thinking capacity that their, their, mind, their mind is open, their mind is transparent, and they're fully in the present moment. And Guy, education. Education has, a, has a, some role to play in this because we are being taught how to think. We have been trained how to think. Those of you, those, you know, we spent 20 years in education. The mind is trained into this sharp analytical tool. We've been trained how to think, but we haven't been trained to stop thinking. And if you develop the mind, you also must develop the capacity to control and train the brain. And again, the breath will come in. Totally. With that, with that oxygen, uh, the, the breath deprivation, like you're saying, breathe slower. Yes. So during our day, 
I'm, I'm guessing, because uh, you, you speak about this, just breathing through the nose will start to do that automatically if we like keep our mouths closed until we talk or eat, basically. It's a great start. It's, okay. it's one of the best things that I would encourage anybody to do. And even during physical exercise, and at, when you're doing it during physical exercise, initially it's tougher. The air hunger is not because of oxygen dropping down or, or lowering. The air hunger is because carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood because you are breathing the stimulated breathe is carbon dioxide. So when carbon dioxide comes from the cells into the blood, there's a change of blood pH and the brain reacts to that drop to blood pH by stimulating your breathing. Now, if you have elite athletes, they have a very reduced chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, so they can tolerate a buildup of CO2 in the blood. Mm. And that's why part of it is they go for a run, they've got very light breathing. But, and you know, it's, it was generally taught that you could reduce the chemosensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide with severe physical training. But no, not at all, just with slow breathing. And, you know, doing bring this into your way of life and also your tongue should be in the roof of the mouth both during rest and during sleep so we often get kids and adults to make the popping sound so in order to make that sound you have to have your tongue pressed in pressed in the roof of the mouth because we need the tongue in the roof of the mouth which will help open up the airway because if the tongue is set back or on the floor of the mouth it's more likely to fall into the throat and then our sleep is affected so I always want my clients waking up with their tongue in the roof of the mouth in the morning and with their lips together. And breathing through the nose, yes, both during rest, during physical exercise and during sleep. We go, we change it. And um, we have to be conscious of that. And what else could you do? Look at breathing from three different perspectives. So say, for okay. instance, it, we would have people with one hand on their chest, one hand just above their navel. And I would ask them to tune into their breath. And then I would say, okay, now I'd really like you to start slowing down the speed of the breath as it comes into your nose. And at the top of the breath, bring a total feeling of relaxation to the body and have a very relaxed and slow breath out. And they could be just shallow breathing, but that's fine. Because with that, my intention is to take less air into the body so that we increase CO2 in the blood to help improve the biochemistry of breathing. So usually I focus with functional breathing, nose breathing first, and we show people how to decongest the nose. You take a normal breath in through the nose, normal breath out, pinch your nose, hold, gently nod your head holding your breath. You keep doing it, and then you let go and breathe through your nose, and you're holding your breath pretty much for as long as you can. If you do that five times, your nose opens up. So anybody with hay fever. Now, it's not, fit, it's not suitable if the female is pregnant or people with mm -hmm. serious health conditions or high blood pressure. But other than that, it's very, very safe. We've been doing breath holding as human beings. If you go to a swimming pool, you'll see kids throwing a diving stick into the bottom of the pool. They go down, they get it, come back up. It's a very natural thing to do. So if the nose is stuffy, just breathe in through your nose, breathe out, pinch your nose, hold, gently nod your head up and down and hold your breath for as long as you can. Then let go, but breathe in through your nose. Wait a minute, do it again. Do it five or six times, nose will be free. Wow. It's only free temporarily. You then have to keep breathing through the nose because your nose conditions, warms and moistens the air on the way in, but it also picks up a gas called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide redistributes the blood throughout the lungs. Did you know that the pressure of oxygen in the blood is 10% higher with nose breathing than with mouth breathing. And by virtue wow. of this, if you look down at your chest, so if you look down at your chest, guy, take a breath through your mouth. So when you breathe through your mouth, what part of the, the body are you bringing the air into? Chest. Chest. So mouth breathing is always synonymous with upper chest, but the structure of the human lungs because of gravity most blood is actually in the lower lobes. So when you breathe through your nose, your nose is connected with the diaphragm. That's why when people are talking about diaphragmatic breathing, they're often emphasizing diaphragmatic breathing, but they're not emphasizing nasal breathing. You, can't, you cannot ensure long-term diaphragmatic breathing. It's literally impossible unless you get nasal breathing. And I like, 
I'm only like I've worked with thousands of clients and I, I, you know, just from experience, you kind of, you're starting to see these connections and they make so much sense. And it's like what you said at the very start, meditation is not for the guy sitting in the lotus position with the eyes closed. Our life is a meditation, mm. but breathing is the same. So what I want is nose breathing, slow breathing driven by the diaphragm. And when you breathe through your nose, you're taking nitric oxide down through the upper airways into the lower airways. Nitric oxide is a natural bronchodilator of the airways, opens up the airways, but it also redistributes the blood throughout the lungs. And this helps with gas exchange to take place. And it also sterilizes the incoming air. Now you think of this coronavirus that's going on at the moment. What about the, the kid or the adult who's just sitting there with the mouth open? You have no defense because if you look at any medical textbook, you will never see a function of the mouth listed as breathing. Breathing is never listed as a function of the mouth because breathing is not a function of the mouth. The nose, the function of the nose is breathing. That's a primary function. And even with young infants, when it's going back to say, yeah, we're, we're born as nose breathers, but say eight, nine months, years of age, sorry, eight or nine months of old, you see the infant crawling, they're exploring. They use their mouth for, for eating and for exploration. You know, they pick up things, they put it straight into the mouth and their nose is for breathing. That's so the primary function of the nose is to breathe and the primary function of the mouth is to eat and to explore. But if that child, if that young infant, if for any reason their nose is stuffy, that they have to breathe through the mouth, now the primary function of the mouth is breathing. And the secondary functions are eating and expiration. So these kids don't normally develop and they can often grow into fussy eating habits. And there's a note, like I could even go on more, but I was reading a paper by Dr. Christian Guimano, infants who died as a result of sudden infant death syndrome, compromised palate, compromised breathing. You know, and the only issue that they had wrong in several of these cases, they had a stuffy nose. That was it. Wow. Can you imagine a head cold resulting in a young infant passing? And it wasn't the head cold. It was the head cold that just pushed the baby over the edge. It was because the airway was compromised in the first instance. There's a, I'm probably speaking too much, but I'm going to just give you, there's an That's orthodontist right. in Sydney called Derek, Dr. Derek Mahoney. And he's an orthodontist and he's, got, he's really well recognized internationally. But he's been doing a PhD, including the effect of mouth breathing on sleep disorder breathing in children. And he would know this topic inside out, back to front. And he was always emphasizing children shouldn't be getting extractions because if you get extractions with orthodontics, the mouth is made smaller, there's not enough room for the tongue, and then the tongue is coming into the airway. So his whole thesis would have been, the reason that the child is crooked teeth is not because the jaw is too small. Sorry, it's not because the, the say that again. The reason, because, the reason that the child has got crooked teeth is not because the teeth are too big, but it's because the jaw is too Sorry. small. Because if we had the mouth closed with the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth, it's the tongue which helps to develop the top jaw. So yeah, I'm going to stop talking for a while. There. Well, it's, it's triggered like because myself and my wife were expecting our first baby in June, and congratulations! Thank you. It's yeah, very exciting. It's brilliant time actually. Yeah, I'm. I'm I can't wait. Um, but yeah. you know, with this knowledge, I'm thinking straight away: is there something we could be doing differently? What do we need to look out for? Or what do we look for? And this is coming from somebody who's never been a parent before as well. Mine, of course. I wouldn't be overly obsessed about it, but what I would do is just pay attention when the child is, is a newborn, um, maybe a few months old, just look and see how high is their palate. Mm -hmm. Because if they've got a high narrow palate, it's not a good sign. My own daughter had it. And you're kind of looking at, you're saying, okay. Um, and then when she was three or four years of age, I was noticing that she was stopping breathing during sleep. And I said, oh my God, she's sleep apnea. Because of course she has my genetic features too. Like genes do play a role here. And if you have a compromised airway, it's a big issue. 
Now, I went and I got the best advice at the time, and that was to get adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy, and I did it. And then I went and I did functional orthodontics with her. Now, if I was to do it again, Guy, I wouldn't do the adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy first. I would bring her, well, first of all, I would bring her to a sacrocranius therapist or an osteopath, because they can literally just put their thumbs into the child's mouth and just gently, just gently, with slight movements, expand the top jaw and expand the maxilla. And also they can help the growth of the face, which is amazing because, see, you don't want a very narrow maxilla because then the nasal cavity is compromised. And if the nasal cavity is compromised, then breathing can be compromised. So if I was to do it again, first of all, I would explore with very young infants, uh, sacrocranial, craniosacral therapy or an osteopath. Somebody with a knowledge of working with the jaws, the maxilla, the top jaw especially. After that then, I would go to a functional orthodontist, especially if the airway was compromised, and use a light wire appliance to direct, to open up the maxilla and to direct the forward growth of the face. And if that didn't work, then I would go for tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. Now, the reason that I say that is because it was traumatic, tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, but it's the gold standard of treatment for sleep disorder breathing. Now, I only found out six months ago that the efficacy of this was only investigated in 2010. So for decades, surgeons have been removing tonsils and adenoids out of young children, and they didn't even know the efficacy of it. They didn't know so-called evidence, and I don't mean to be sarcastic here, but so-called evidence-based medicine. And I'll give you the result of this study. And as far as I remember, it was published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine by the American Thoracic Society. They tested 587 children, and sleep disorder breathing was cured in 27%. So even despite having adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy, 73% of these kids continued to have residual obstructive sleep apnea. Now, we also know that if nasal breathing is not restored in these children, despite having tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, there's a 65% relapse within three years, 65% relapse. Now, the last thing I'll say on that topic is, well, I talk more about it, but in terms of ear, nose and throat doctors don't provide any follow-up in terms of nasal breathing. And I gave this talk to 150 ENTs in Madrid of the last year, 2019. And I said, I was one of your patients. You operated on my nose. You certainly fixed it, but you never taught me how to breathe through it. You cannot just fix the nose without changing the behavior. If you have a young kid who's been mouth breathing with their tongue out because of nasal obstruction, and if you fix the nose, and you, if, if you fix the back of the nose, you know, you have to restore nasal breathing because otherwise mouth breathing is going to continue. When it, when it comes to kids, are they easy to work with, to, to retrain, to get them to be breathing through their nose? From a certain age, yeah. It's like, there's a book, this is not new information. There was a book written back in the 1870s and oh. it's called Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life. And it was an American painter that went and he lived with the American Native American Indians. He thought that their traditions were dying out. So he went and lived with them. And he noted that the, the Native American Indian mothers, anytime the young infant had the mouth open, the mothers would go over to the baby and press the lips together, kept on pressing the lips together. And I think it's great wisdom, simple stuff, you know? So when you see your youngster um, and just like, we didn't put our child on, on our back, but we had a, a, a mattress that was really natural. Um, the fibers were totally natural. Everything was natural. There was nothing synthetic. Everything was breathable. And the child naturally stepped on her side. And, you know, I understand that there's the, all of the advice on sleeping on the back, and that's fine. I'm not going to, I'm not going to you know, cast doubt on that. But I just felt with my own child, I didn't really want her sleeping in the back because I didn't want the risk of the tongue falling back into the throat to compromise her breathing. And I didn't want that with the lower jaw falling back because we have to bear in mind gravity. Like in an adult, if an adult is snoring, 
they're more likely to snore when they're on their back than mm. when they're on their side. Mm. And with obstructive sleep apnea, 50% of people with OSA, oh, obstructive sleep apnea, their apnea is double when they sleep on their back. So coming back to teaching the exercises, you can, you can do little things with the younger kids, certainly even a young infant, having them on your lap, just pressing the lips together. But also, there are simple exercises with children. Now, we have a children's online course, but it's free. And we are, we've recorded as well a series of videos with my own kid, and we're putting them out there for free, but we haven't Amazing. put them up yet. And all of things up there. It, it will be up there. It's it's. Um, I just haven't. Got, I've made the edits, but I, I have to get it. But I do at the moment have a free online course. If you went to butecoclinic.com, and I'm not sure if the link, but you look for the kids course. Now it does look for your email address, but it, 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 the course is completely free. Now this was recorded ten years ago. But the new one going up will be much easier. And I just recorded before Christmas. So that'll be live, hopefully in the next month. That's brilliant. That's awesome, mate. I am, I'm aware of the time. And uh, there's so many questions I could ask you. But there's a, <laughs> it's just every, every answer you give triggers a new question. Um, but um, I'm going to ask a few questions that I ask everyone on the show. And, sure. uh, and the first one is, what's been a low point in your life that's later been a blessing? Well, it's, it's going to come back to my own health issues, okay. you know. Um, it's, it's, it really is the pro... And it, you know, there's been two things that have been low points. One was I hated my job in the corporate world. I used to work for this company called Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And uh, I don't mind mentioning the, the name of their company because I think it's, it's good if I would have liked to have heard this, heard this information when I was 20 years of age. So I absolutely was stressed going into work. Now, part of it was because I didn't have a great ability to handle stress. And at the time, my sleep was affected and everything else. So part of it would have been, say, my problem. And part of it then would have been the ethos of mm. not just enterprise, but the ethos of most multinational companies. And I used to be envious, envious of these guys going in the suits into the, the financial companies, you know. And then I was in New York during the summer and said, my God, like, I have a wonderful job here with, with rewarding job satisfaction, doing a job that I love to do, seeing results. And I could never go up into those big offices in a gray suit and just sit behind a computer, look at analytics and statistics and this, that, and the other. So the first thing that was, was bad that turned out to be a blessing was I hated my job. And that was a part motivation to do something about it. And probably the worst thing could have been that you're in a nice cushy, cushy job because then you get nowhere. You're better off realizing that even if you hate your job though, apply your talents to the best of your ability because you're not here just for your employer, but you're here to employ yourself. Mm. And even though I did hate my job, I gave it my best shot. And you know, you learn stuff and you develop confidence in yourself. And then those skills do actually they'll always help you for the rest of your life. So it's amazing too. There's often, a, you know, things mightn't feel the best now, but watch that space. If you're really giving it your best shot, and this is where watch your mind, you know, keep an eye on your mind because the stress levels, you don't want them, like life is a lot softer when the mind is quieter. And of course things happen in life. You know, life can be tough and life can be challenging. But life is definitely softer when you have the ability or you have a tool to help bring a quietness to the mind. And even if it's just for a few seconds, you slow down your breathing. You go back to the mind, you slow down your breathing. But at least you can help create gaps between thoughts. So yeah, health issues, that turned into a positive. And the job I hated, that turned into a positive. Yeah, love the, love the wisdom. Um, what does your morning routine look like? It can depend. Sometimes I can get up very early, four o'clock in the morning, and first thing I'll do is I'll have a coffee. And then I'll generally actually concentrate on working on a new book that I'm writing. Because oh, wow. um, I tend to write them 
in the very early hours. One of the books, the, the most recent one, The Oxygen Advantage, was written at four o'clock in the morning. And I'd write between four and say half seven. And then I'd go up and my daughter gets, gets up and we, we, myself and my wife get her ready for school and that. And then I kind of take it easy and then I'll go on a treadmill for a while and then I'll come back to my emails. But I get a lot of emails. So my work is like today, sometimes I just go through, I just give a quick scan of the emails today. I had 75 emails answered. Like oh, wow. It's, sometimes it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and that's only touching the... We have a girl, a colleague that's great and she's, she gets such a volume as well. So, But, you know, maybe... This is the way it is. Like it's, it's, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're always wanting breathing to get out there and breathing now is really, really hot and it's out there and yeah, it's great. So I'm, I'm so fortunate. So yeah. So tomorrow morning, I've no idea what time I have to fly to London then tomorrow evening and I've got a, a BBC interview on Thursday, one with the doctor of the house from channel four on Friday. And then I fly back on Saturday and I got flew in from Poland last night. So, wow. so now you can kind of get an idea of it. And you yeah. squeeze me in in between. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. So yeah. Good. <laughs> did, 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 you, did you like expect the success of your book, The Oxygen Advantage? Because I've been hearing that from everywhere, mate. Like it, it might, I don't mm. know if it's the circles are moving or, or what. Well, if, if somebody told me 20 years ago that you would have trained instructors in about 40 countries, um, the oxygen advantage is going into 40 languages. I wouldn't have believed them. Let's be honest with you. I have no idea that I would have never had an expectation that something so, you know, that it's probably because it just felt an innate, like I've, I have a job that suits me. And, you know, my, my ability, I love the whole aspect of, you know, even talking in front of groups um, trying to put the courses together, putting the research together, trying to stay on top of it. But it all becomes easy because you have an interest in it. Mm. Like it's easy for me to pick up a book and, and breathing. It's easy for me to read a paper and breathing because I love the information. So I would never have guessed that it would, we would have had such an impact. It's been huge. I'm very grateful for it. It's been great. Yeah, fantastic. Um, last question. If you could have dinner with anyone tonight from anywhere in the world in any time frame, who do you think it would be and why? If I was to, sp- if I was to sit down for dinner genuinely with somebody, it would be Eckhart Tolle. Hmm. Um, I've been a great fan of his work. I read his book first back in 2000, The Power of Now. And it was one book that I really, really took it on board. It was tremendous. You know, and he comes across as a very sincere and genuine individual. Um, and also, when you're listening to him, you, you get the presence and the, the space there. And, it, you know, if you're exposed to somebody who is in presence, that their mind is present, it automatically brings you into presence. Mm. And, it, you know, as human beings, we talk and we communicate, but we never seem to consider what are we transmitting that's outside of the words. And there has to be some connectivity there. And, I, you know... People could say, well, you, how can you prove it? Or is there science behind that? There's no science because we probably will never be able to quantify everything. We don't even know why we're here. We don't know the basic questions of, of life. So how can we quantify everything in science? There, there's an intelligence that is way beyond that which the human mind could ever fathom. And spirituality and the essence of the quietness of the mind. I think Eckhart Tolle has done a tremendous job putting it out there. He really, really has. So, yeah. So, two, two people who are completely opposites of either, each other. An ego and a no ego. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that book's tremendous. It had a huge impact on me when I read it as well, for it sure. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add from everything we've covered today for the listeners to ponder on? Yeah, I would say like explore breathing. Um, you can explore from a number of different point of views. And even if you were to read one article, read an article by Mark Russell, and it's called Slow Breathing. And basically, because he kind of summarizes nicely the, the impact of the breath and what we can do. Bodily systems which are disturbed by stress, you can help recover. 
And individuals with, say, post-traumatic stress disorder, asthma, COPD, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, depression, anxiety, panic disorder. We, you know, and then the athletes. So we have individuals coming in who are coming in very unwell. And they're doing Buteco. And elite athletes. And we're preparing some of the Australian um, national team for the Olympics. It's your, your kayaking team. For some of them have trained with us about three years ago. Okay. And they've, they have, they've been practicing. I haven't been in touch with them now in a while. But they did a course about three years ago. And their instructors are trained in Oxygen Advantage. So they apply it. So I would say to people, you know, the power of the breath and it's not just about taking the deep breath. It's about really looking at the breath from three different perspectives. The biochemistry, the biomechanics, and cadence breathing. And, you know, slowing it down to six breaths per minute, breathing in and out through your nose, breathing using the diaphragm, breathing very lightly. So the best way to remember it is LSD, especially for those 1990s teenagers. So light, slow, and deep breathing is the mantra. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. And uh, you're, you're going to be in Australia soon, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, in a, a few weeks, towards the end of March. Towards the end of March. So, yeah, so it's uh, the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th for Buteco. And then we have Oxygen Advantage in, in the weekend following that. So, awesome. yeah, I always love going, getting over to Sydney. It takes me a while to acclimatize to the change of hours. Like, it's kind of strange. You're 8.30 in the morning now, and I'm nearly 11 o'clock at night, so, or you're 9.30, yeah. whatever, you know, but yeah. it's so cool. It's a great country to go to, and uh, yeah, I can, see, I can see the draw. Yeah, brilliant. Well, anyone listening to this, if they pause it and scroll down, there'll be links in the show notes if they want to come, come along and check your workout. Sure. Great. Thanks, Guy. Patrick, thanks so much for coming on today, mate. That was amazing, and um, hopefully I, I'll get to chat to you again at some stage for sure. Of course. Yes. Yeah. Appreciate everything Thanks you do, much. mate. You're no welcome. Worries.